A Stuart Beam Engine Refurbishment, Part 8, Making a Condenser Oil Trap Every model steam engine really does need a condenser oil trap, not maybe to act as a condenser, but to trap the oil, otherwise the oil goes up the chimney, along with a lot of water and gurgles and spits and crackles. There are many different ways to make condenser oil traps for model steam engines, this is just one of them. This condenser is pretty much the same design as the one that I made for the Twin Victoria steam plant. This clip shows me using an ME type tap, which stands for model engineering, to thread a couple of holes in one of the end plates. These holes have been threaded quarter by 40 threads per inch, and the hole starts off as a 7 30 seconds of an inch hole. You will notice that I'm using a tap guide to keep the tap square to the work. For this beam engine application, I need to fit a bush to the top of the main copper tube. This bush is also threaded quarter by 40 threads per inch, and this will accept the quarter of an inch diameter exhaust pipe from the beam engine. I'm taking this opportunity to show first of all how not to do it, mainly to show how ineffective silver soldering can be and how difficult it can be if your blowtorch has too small a burner fitted. This burner head is what I would normally use for silver soldering small pipes, and it's nowhere near powerful enough to heat this component to the correct temperature required for silver soldering. And now I'm going to apply some silver solder even though the part is not yet hot enough. And the silver solder just sticks on the side like a blob. And that's no good at all. If the temperature was correct, the first thing that you would notice is that the flux would take on a watery appearance. And as soon as I touch the silver solder on the part, it would flash around the joint. But because the part isn't hot enough, it doesn't flash around the joint, it just stays on the surface. Example number two, the correct amount of heat for the size of the components. I just changed the size of the gas nozzle on the blowtorch head. This is a sievert system, and it's a good idea to obtain one of these if you intend to do a lot of silver soldering. But if you don't have one of these systems, there are a couple of alternatives. You could go out and buy a second blowtorch like the one you're currently trying to use. That would double up the heat, and it would probably make it work. You could also put the entire assembly on an external heat source like a gas cooker and do it that way, but that may cause domestic friction. As you can see now the part's been hot enough for some time, and as soon as I touched the silver solder stick on the joint, the silver solder immediately flashed all the way around the joint. If this was a steam pipe I would let it cool to black and quench it, but on larger components that's not a good idea because they can distort. I left this component on the vise just to cool in its own time, then I lowered it into the acid bath after tying it to a piece of silicone rubber tubing, then I replaced the lid and left it in there for some time. And now for something completely different. I'm marking out the first of the pieces of brass angle that I'm going to cut to fit on the end plates. And here's the first of the cut pieces, and I'm marking it out for the rivet positions. This piece of brass is two and a half inches long, and I'm marking quarter of an inch divisions on it. I don't use a scriber, I just use a sharp needle file. And once I clearly mark the divisions on the first piece, I hold the first piece of brass against the second piece of brass and copy the positions of the divisions onto the other piece. This is the unscientific method, so I'm sure some viewers would be critical of this. It would have been better to use the milling machine as a drilling machine for this operation, and I could simply wind the handle to get the quarter of an inch spacing between the holes. But before I get a barrage of expert comments telling me I'm doing it all wrong, please be aware for the umpteenth time that these are tutorials primarily designed for beginners. And when I was a beginner, I didn't have a milling machine, and I had a really crappy drilling machine. And having said that, I've still got a crappy drilling machine. I really must get rid of this thing and buy a better quality one that doesn't wander all over the place like this one. But I know how bad my drilling machine is, so I sort of compensate for that and the holes are more than accurate enough for this job anyway. After cleaning off the burrs on the holes on the other side of this brass angle using my belt sander, I use some Loctite 603 to stick the brass angle to the end plate, and then I repeat the process and stick the other piece of brass angle to the other end plate. In retrospect, I suppose I could have just silver soldered these pieces of brass angle to their respective end plates, and I wouldn't have had to drill all these holes either. But call me old fashioned, but I do like the look of rivets on items like this. Only 10 minutes later, and the Loctite had done the trick, it was time to drill the holes all the way through. All I did first, though, was just spot the holes, just in case the Loctite gave way and the part fell off, 
at least I would have a reference where the holes needed to be without actually having to stick the angle back onto the metal plate. I did exactly the same with the second end plate. First of all I spotted through the holes then I drilled all the way through. The twist drill that I'm using for doing this is a number drill and it's just a tiny bit bigger than a sixteenth of an inch diameter because I found a sixteenth of an inch diameter drill wouldn't let the sixteenth rivets that I've got through. This is a rivet snap that I found in my toolbox. It's the only one I could find. I don't do much riveting with sixteenth of an inch diameter rivets. This is a bit grim really but it will have to do. So here you can clearly see the principle. The rivet snap is held in the vise and I'm putting the rivets through the holes and as you can see the rivet snap is concave so it doesn't damage the rivet head and all I'm doing is flattening the other side. It's quite important to make sure that you get the rivet square on the rivet snap and this is a special small hammer that I bought years and years ago that I use for riveting small components. I did buy another one more recently with a plastic handle but that broke. So it's back to my old faithful for this job. If I had a second rivet snap I could shape the heads using that so they would look the same as the ones on the other side but all I'm doing is flattening them over. Or what I could do is countersink the holes and hammer these rivets into a countersink and once the metal plate was cleaned up on the belt sander they would be more or less invisible. For this application though I like them the way they are. I know I'm making this look quite easy and I suppose it's not that difficult but when you first do it you make a mess of it. It's vital to hold the part at 90 degrees to the rivet snap and even more important than that you need to learn how to control the hammer and this can only be done by practice. You've just seen how long it took me to get the parts to this stage and that wasn't including cutting and rounding the end plates. It's very easy to become demoralised in this hobby so what I would say to you is practice first before making a thorough mess of something you've spent a lot of time working on just rivet some random pieces of metal together and you'll get good results. This clip shows me cleaning up the end of the rivets on the belt sander and here I'm using a piece of scotch brite to finish them off. This is Friolux solder paint and with this I'm going to solder the brass tube to the pair of end plates that I've made. You will notice that I'm applying a copious amount of this Friolux paint which is a bit of a shame really as it's quite expensive and I'm also applying this Friolux paint a full quarter of an inch up inside the tube. This is so that when the tube is finally sat in position like you see it at the moment and I heat it with the blowtorch, the solder will melt and a generous amount of this solder will flow and form a large fillet on the inside which gives a bit of extra strength. This is the base that I'm making for the boiler and it's going to match the base that the beam engine is sat on and if you want to see the details of the boiler for this engine please look at my In The Workshop series, it's on there because it's not really part of refurbishing a model beam engine. I only put that image on screen to show you what it is because I'm going to use it for another function in a moment. I'm going to use it to make sure that the base is in full alignment. This is done by eye but thankfully once again with practice you do develop quite a good eye for things. And in this clip I'm soldering together the other end and I'm being really careful not to dislodge the tube and lose the position once I start the soldering process. As usual I'm using a small paintbrush with some water to clean up the job and after the part has been left on the vise to cool in its own time I try it on the engine's bed plate in the position it's going to be and that looks pretty good to me. Everything's in balance. The condenser is not dwarfing the boiler and it's not dwarfing the engine either but the condenser is big enough to not need emptying all the time. All I need to do now is mount the condenser to the bed plate with four bolts, paint it the same colour as the engine which is British Railways pre-1953 green quite a nice colour. Then I need to pipe it to the boiler and that's it. So I'm getting very close to doing the final in steam video. This is what I normally do by the way. I build things, I play with them for a while and then generally I will sell some of them on to finance another project. So that's just about it for now. All I'd like to say is thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.